Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, those of you who are a bit surprised, perhaps you were expecting Bill. So first and foremost, wanted to apologize, but also promise you that I'm going to give you as equally good of a presentation as our CEO. But before we get started, I also wanted to ask for a round of applause for my birthday, because today is my birthday. <laughs> um, so after taking a red-eye flight from Singapore throughout the night, waking up and finding out that today is my birthday, I've also a surprise and said that you are presenting in four hours. <laughs> so let's give it a go. So my presentation, there it is. Excellent. So today we wanted to talk to you about Abra, but first and foremost, we wanted to talk to you about the notion of combining the forces of the sharing economy the forces of technology innovation, and to a certain degree, technology disruption and business model disruption, and how that can impact, and more than anything, benefit our efforts of financial inclusion. So how many of you actually know what this word means? Very few, probably. So what this word means, and what we learn in our physics classes, is that it means that nature tends towards disorder. Nature tends towards disruption. And while many, let's say, existing incumbent business models and, let's say, incumbent companies would tend to be discomforted by that, and while in some cases certain individuals would be comfortable by that, we believe that entrepreneurs thrive in that. So we believe that entrepreneurs can actually thrive in the environment when certain forces are coming together and disrupting how things have been done and redefining how things will be done in the future. So, can actually see that. There we go. So we want to talk to you about three forces today and how they can benefit financial inclusion. The first one is the sharing economy. The second one is the proliferation of smartphones. And the third is a proliferation of global applications. So first and foremost, as we all very well know, the sharing economy is here. As Uber has taught us, you can build the largest transportation company in the world, and in the grand scheme of things, in less than five years, without owning one taxi, without employing one driver, and without having to have any, let's say, vehicle infrastructure whatsoever. Airbnb has taught us, again, in less than five or six years, that you can build what is basically the largest hospitality company in the world without owning one hotel and without having to employ one employee. And then Kickstarter, which is now almost 10 years old to a certain degree, has taught us that by bringing the forces together, you can actually give birth to new companies. And as we're seeing here as well, Corsica, we have Zopa, we have Lending Club, all of these forces have taught us that it's actually possible to bring together people, to bring together the forces of democracy in the true sense of the word, and create businesses that have never been created before, or solve problems to a certain degree that have always been needed to be solved. The second force is smartphone penetration. All of us know that Smartphone penetration is growing. What we also will soon see, and soon and soon here as well in the Philippines as the market opens up to other players, that smartphones are growing at a rapid pace. But what we perhaps didn't actually realize is that when we have more smartphones, and we also bring together cheaper, better data plans, that literally smartphone traffic, the accessing of internet and the accessing of applications is projected to grow by eightfold in less than five years. As we all very well know as well, we're now living in an app economy. We're living in a world where applications are the predominant way that we're accessing information, the predominant way that we're interacting with websites. This is a stat here that shows how many users are actively accessing these applications. WeChat, for those of you who don't know, is actually one of the largest messaging applications based out of China. It is predominantly is the predominant player in the market. But all of these applications are also, once again, demonstrating that people are accessing information, they're accessing these applications, and that this is a trend that is going to continue to grow. Here's another one that shows, combined with the previous slide, that there are millions and millions of users. So when WhatsApp set out to start a company, it set out to solve one particular problem, which was how much it costs to send an SMS message in between two different countries. Literally in less than six years, they now have 700 million active users. 
of which the predominant number of those users are actually interacting and communicating with each other in a domestic sense of the word. WeChat, close to 500. Skype, I think, is now close to 400 million. And all of these are demonstrating that the sharing economy is here to stay, this technological disruption is here to stay, but yet, for some reason, we have yet to see a true disruption in payments and in money transfer. Now, what we do know, particularly here in the Philippines, the country more or less where mobile money gave birth, with the likes of smart money, with the likes of Gcash, is that there have been efforts over the past 10 years, primarily led by banks and primarily led by telcos, to promote financial inclusion and to promote access to payments via the telcos and the banks. And our conclusion is, in the grand scheme of things, that effort has failed. 250 mobile money applications, or let's say efforts, initiatives, as you may call it, across the world, and one effort, M-Pesa. All of us have heard about M-Pesa. All of us are, to a certain degree, to the point of nausea that we continue to hear the example of M-Pesa. But what very few people actually know is that M-Pesa represents 15% of all volume going through 250 mobile money initiatives. So in relative terms, we would actually argue that despite these efforts, they have failed. But why should we care? In the grand scheme of things, most of us in this audience have a debit card. Most of us have a credit card. Most of us have no issues with moving money or making payments. But our reality is not the reality of the vast majority of people. Here in the Philippines, it's estimated that 85% of the population does not have access to financial services, does not have access to the digital economy. And while they are using the likes of the pawn shops, while they're using the likes of informal networks, the reality is what is happening here in the Philippines, which is the fifth largest inbound market for remittances, is not unlike what's happening in the vast majority of emerging markets. Now, official stats would suggest that the entire global remittance market is approximately $500 billion. $500 billion going in between the likes of richer company, countries to the likes of what we would call poorer countries. And the livelihoods depend upon that movement of funds. But what many people don't actually know or don't feel comfortable discussing is that the market is probably at least 2x that. Because approximately 415 billion additional dollars is moved across borders through informal Hawala networks, which is basically an individual calling up another individual, sending an email to another individual and say, can you give my mother money? I will get it to you in some other way. Here in Southeast Asia, in conversations that we've had with business leaders, in conversations we've had with government officials, in, in conversations we've had with development individuals, they actually estimate that 25% of, of domestic GDP is moved through informal Hawala networks. And what does that actually demonstrate? That despite the efforts of the telcos, despite the efforts of banks, despite the efforts, in the grand scheme of things, of governments, and numerous applications that are out there, there are still millions of people that do not have access to the same payment services that we have access to. Now, for those that do have access to payment services, many of us, primarily those living in markets where things are more expensive, where we have an interest in buying a plane ticket from another country, or we have interest in buying something from another country, are involved in what is called cross-border e-commerce. So when we ask, when we purchase something from the Amazon site in the United States, and we have it shipped to us by someone, or when we send it to a forwarding address in the United States, that is called the cross-border commerce market. Now, this is a stat that says that the percentage of where cross-border commerce is happening, and the reason that that is happening is because things are cheaper, there's access to more products, but fundamentally, what we also probably realize, many of us that even are in the segment A, have four credit cards, are making very good money, that probably in most cases, between 10 and 20% of the time that we try to use our credit card to conduct those transactions, it's declined. It's declined because we're transacting from a high-risk country. It's declined because the fraud models in the United States are not adequate to accept the Philippine credit card, to accept the card from Indonesia. And as a result, 
we do not truly have access to the world of comrades that everyone else has access to. So what are people buying? Fairly obvious, interesting enough. Um, many of the of cross-border commerce is moved by women. Um, not surprising. Um, buying clothes, buying health and beauty products, etc. And consequently, you bring yourself, well, why is it that when all of these things are happening, so when we talk about what we're doing, we say, we're not creating a problem that doesn't exist. And we're not solving something that people are not able to solve already. The vast majority of people, as we've seen, are already sending money. The vast majority of people are hacking a way to facilitate cross-border commerce. The vast majority of people are facilitating a way to get money from UAE back to Mumbai, back to Manila, or from UAE to Mumbai. The reality is that the market exists. What also is true is that it's extremely painful and not necessarily efficient. So what Abra set out to do is to solve those problems. How could you create a single application, an app, that allows people to send and receive money anywhere in the world, in any currency, by only knowing the other person's phone number? How could you build the WhatsApp of money movement? Impossible, right? Technologically impossible. No one would actually get it. Well, Abra has done it. Abra has developed the world's first money movement application that by downloading the application, typing in your phone number, and validating your phone number in the same way that all of us have downloaded Viper, that we've downloaded Line, that we've downloaded WhatsApp, that allows you to download the application and to immediately be able to hold, send, or spend money anywhere in the world directly from your smartphone. So how does it work? So first and foremost, the way Abra works is you need a smartphone, you need access to data, you download our application, and therefore we need to answer the question of, well, how do I get money in and out of the system? If you're a bank consumer, meaning you're someone that already has a bank account here in the Philippines or elsewhere in the world, we are integrated to the local banking systems in the case that you can use your debit card, your ATM card to get money in the system, or you can link your bank account and transfer money into the system. But the part that is most interesting and comes back to the concept of the sharing economy is turning every single smartphone potentially into a human ATM. So let's take a step back. Western Union will tell you that they are the largest money transmitter company in the world. And the reason that you cannot compete with them is because they have 500,000 locations. It took them 130 years to build out 500,000 locations. It's taken us as a society in the modern world 30 years to have 4 million, yes, only 4 million ATMs globally. We have heard from studies, telcos, aka experts, that there's approximately 30 to 40 million people in the world that are actively selling airtime. And Abra is on a mission to turn every single one of those locations into a human ATM. So how does that work? The way it works is you first open up the application, you find an Abra teller. On the map, you'll see the teller. You'll see the teller location. You'll see what price the teller is going to charge you to get money in and out of the system. The beauty of our system and our belief is that we've completely changed the model, but actually very similar to the model that exists for Palala here with smart money. You pay to get money in the system, and you pay to get money out of the system. Now, the other difference, however, is that every single teller in the system sets his or own price to facilitate that conversion from physical paper cash to digital cash. So in the money transmitter model, how does it work? The company, the facilitator of the service, sets the price. And as prices tend to go down, the margins of those agents or of those windows that are facilitating the movement of funds 
their margin gets cut in half every time price gets cut in half. Where in Avro's model, each individual teller gets to set their own price. So if you happen to be in a far off village, you charge a little bit more. If you're in downtown Manila, you charge a little bit less because the market dynamics will change the price. Once you have funds in the application, you're able to send it to anyone else that has applications. So it works very similar, if not equally the same as WhatsApp. As soon as you listen, your friends, your family, whoever it might be has application, the money goes between your smartphone and their smartphone. If they don't have it, you forward them invitation, they download the application, and they're good to go. And they receive the money. At the moment that they receive the money, again, what do they do? They push it to their bank account if they happen to be a bank consumer. And if they're not a bank consumer, they find a teller and pull the money out. So here we have what the app looks like. You'll see this is, this is an app that will be live here in the Philippines more or less within a week to two weeks. So we'd invite you to keep your eyes out on Google Play and also keep your eyes out for the probably a few weeks after with the iTunes store. Here in the Philippines is our actual launch market. So we're very excited to be launching the company first here in the Philippines and then shortly thereafter in the United States. You see this is what the experience looks like of finding a teller, the experience of what it looks like to send money, the experience of what it looks like to transfer the money, meaning cash out to your bank account or withdraw cash. You'll see on the right what the teller app looks like. They have three buttons whereas the individual on the left is a user and they have two. So let's take a step back. So what Avro has just said is that you can have a system that works where you can send money between any two smartphones. What Avro has also said is you've just turned every smartphone in the world into a human ATM. And lastly, what Avro said is that you can do it in any currency in real time anywhere in the world. You've now created the first application in the world that is a convergence between sending money, spending money, and storing money. So that's what Abra is. I'm happy to obviously take some questions since I've gone fairly quickly through the presentation, but just taking a step back and telling you where we are as a company. So Abra is a, a startup based in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, the same place that Google is located. Um, we are backed by the likes of American Express, First Round Capital, which is one of the early investors into Uber. We're backed by RRE Ventures, which is a fund that was started by the former CEO of American Express. Um, Arbor Ventures, which is a firm out of Hong Kong and China. Jungle, which is a firm based out of Singapore. Other investors on individual letter include um, Ratan Tata and the likes of many other investors. So, Again, thank you very much. That's Haber. I invite you to download the application. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask.